Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to today's UK Data Service event, Poverty and Data Research Policy um, and Next Steps. We're um, very glad to have you all with us. Uh, we think that um, uh, the data service, these issues of poverty measurement are, are very complex. Uh, they're very important. And we're bringing together today for you some of the most important commentators, advocates, uh, and lobbyists in the poverty arena. We hope you enjoy the event um, uh, and, and uh, learn a lot from it and, and take something away with you today. Um, my name's Deborah Price. I'm a professor of social gerontology at the University of Manchester with a long-standing interest in poverty. And I'm a deputy director of the UK Data Service, which is very proud to host this event today. This is the third event this week uh, around the issue of poverty and data. We held a very successful uh, ECR event um, earlier in the week on Tuesday in Manchester. And yesterday we had a number of speakers contribute to a presentation about perspectives in poverty, which is available for anybody on our YouTube channel. Uh, so just to run through a, a bit of housekeeping for the day. Um, there'll be opportunities throughout the day for you to just add Q&A in the Q&A panel, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. We'll be gathering questions together to present the panel after all of the presentations. Um, I think if we can, do, do we have a slide showing the order of business of the day? Olivia, Dave, yes, thank you. So we're going to get to have presentations from four people, as I say, four leaders in the field in poverty advocacy. Helen uh, Barnard from the Trussell Trust, Ed Davis, Centre for Social Justice, Lalitha Tri from the Resolution Foundation, and Peter Masajic um, from Joseph Roundtree. Many names uh, are familiar to, to many of you, I'm sure. We're then going to have a comfort break when we'll show you some videos um, from the UK Data Service about the experiences of living with poverty, and then we'll reconvene at 11.55 for the Q&A session uh, and then close at 12.30. Uh, it feels like a very important time in poverty research um, with high quality data uh, of critical importance in order for researchers, advocates and lobbyists to show um, governments, policymakers and others active in the policy field what is happening in terms of poverty in our society today. Uh, we need to provide robust and irrefutable uh, evidence uh, of what is going on so that people can't hide away um, from the truth. Uh, we're very privileged to be joined by our panelists today, and it's my special privilege to start by introducing um, Helen Barnard, who's going to kick us off. Helen is Director of Policy, Research and Impact at the Trussell Trust, a charity that's playing a more and more important role pretty much with every passing day in the UK. She was formerly Director of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Research and Policy Director at Pro Bono Economics. She's a leading national expert on poverty, uh, inequality and social policy. Her extensive body of research and policy work have covered poverty, destitution, labour markets, housing, social security, and civil society. She's author of Want, Giants, a new beverage report, which examines modern day poverty and the institutions and reforms required to address it. We're very privileged that she's agreed to speak to you all today. And I will now hand over to Helen. Thank you, Helen. Fantastic, thank you very much, Deborah, and wonderful to be here with you. So Deborah says, I'm at the Trussell Trust, and many of you will know we're an anti-poverty charity. We support a network of about 1,400 food bank centres across the country, and data and evidence are at the heart of what we do, both in terms of operationally, how we support people and communities, and in our policy and campaigning work. So if we go on to the first slide, I just want to very quickly talk about um, what we're seeing out there. So I think if you could just bring up all the bullets. But I would say the most striking trend that we've seen in recent years is steeply rising numbers of people, not just in poverty, but in deep poverty and destitution. So the Joseph Rantry Foundation research that I'm sure Peter will mention, which looks every two years at what's happening to that most severe form of poverty, destitution, found in 2022, it was up to 3.8 million people. And that was almost two and a half times the number of people that we saw in destitution back in 2017. So that is an incredibly fast and worrying increase. 
We know from other research that both we and JRF and others have done that if you look at people on universal credit, which should be protecting them, all, a large proportion of those people actually can't afford essentials. And just as one example, research we did earlier this year found that more than half of people on universal credit had run out of food and couldn't afford more in the month uh, previous to the survey. So this is an incredibly worrying depth of poverty as well as scale of poverty. And if we go on to the next slide, we see that in our um, operational data as well. So when we looked last year, at the end of last year, we found that we had provided almost 3 million emergency food parcels across the, our network. That was a 37% increase compared to the previous year. Really worryingly, it's part of a long-term trend. So over five years, the number of people having to turn to a food bank to, for support has more than doubled. It's worth just saying before I move on, we also know from our wider research that actually the people that we see at food banks and that the independent food banks see, they are not all the people who are going hungry in our country. About two thirds of people facing hunger have not yet reached out to any charitable food support. So as stark as our stats are, they are always only the tip of the iceberg of what's happening out there in the country. So if we move on now, so how we, how we use research and data in our work to try and end the need for food banks, which is our goal. Now, the cycle up there will probably look quite familiar to people who are engaged in policy development um, or in policy related research. And I'm just going to go round and quickly touch on how we use data to do these different things. So if you go on to the next slide, the first thing we use data for is actually to understand the problem we're trying to solve. We need to know how many people are facing deep poverty, hunger, severe uh, hardship. We need to know who they are, where they are. We need to understand why that's happening. So we use a combination of the big familiar household surveys, so family resources survey, HBAI, Understanding Society. We also have a large scale program of research, a six year program of research with YouGov called Hunger in the UK, where we're doing the most in-depth, large-scale study of what is causing, who is in, who is facing hunger, what's causing it. And we also do various different bespoke surveys, qualitative work. And of course, we look at our own operational data from across our network. If you go on to the next slide, so having understood the problems, we then use data and research to understand the drivers and crucially to then help us put together what are the interventions that could prevent this happening. So we use our operational insights. So we understand from the data across our network that many people coming to us are in multiple forms of debt. They don't have savings. Most have, or uh, many have encountered an unexpected cost they couldn't uh, cover in the previous three months. Those kinds of insights have fed directly into the work we've done on what should something like the Household Support Fund look like? What does it need to provide to try and help people who are struggling not reach that point of crisis that leads them to the doors of a food bank. We also use traditional methods. We do national and international literature reviews. So we're about to embark on how can we improve the PIP disability benefits assessment process. And the first thing we're going to be doing is looking internationally at how do other countries do this. We use a lot of participatory work. So there's a technique that my team have been using for the last couple of years called legislative theatre. Uh, which is an amazing technique, which has helped us get under the skin of how things could change. And we use evaluations. So right now, Bristol University are doing a big evaluation of all of our financial inclusion uh, services. That will give us the evidence to understand, not just for ourselves, where do we put our resources, where do, how do we improve, but to take to other providers of financial inclusion and advice and commissioners to be able to say to them, this is what it achieves, this is the population we are reaching who are not being reached by other services, and here's what we've learned about how this works. And we do modelling. So we've just started to work with uh, WPI Economics on a project which is going to try and model the cost of destitution. So what are the knock-on costs to individuals, communities, society, services, the economy of allowing this many people to get stuck in destitution? If we move on to the next slide, 
We then, we test out. So we come up with ideas of solutions. Some of them we can test out through our own network. We can learn what works and what doesn't. We can also use formal evaluation. And of course, we can use those big household surveys. So we've just been doing a piece of, a commissioned a piece of work to understand what impact the Scottish child payment is having on hunger, severe hardship in Scotland to help us learn from that. Uh, and we have ongoing outcome measures, which we use to track what's working, what's not. If we go on to the next slide, the third way that we use research and data is in case making. So we are campaigning for changes that will mean that people never need to use a food bank again. They have the money to afford essentials and we need evidence for that. Um, so we do things that many of my fellow panellists will also be doing, costing up policies, doing cost benefit analysis, using public polling and public qualitative evidence to be able to understand what interventions will land with the public, what will there be public support for. We use evaluation evidence to demonstrate the impact and the payoff you will get for doing things. We also try and use data and evidence in our campaigning communications work. So we're trying to be very purposeful about how we communicate the problem and the solutions in order to build that public support. And so we are gathering data through, you know, trying out literally different forms of uh, interventions on Facebook, on Instagram, on other platforms, and tracking who engages and how they engage and what kind of reactions we get. Now, if we move on to the next slide. So the, the last way that we use research and data is in holding to account. So that is both holding ourselves to account. So as an organisation, as a leadership team, we are accountable to our network who we're there to serve. We are accountable to the people and the communities that they are serving. And we're accountable to the donors who make our work po possible, to the public, because uh, we're primarily funded through public donations, to trust the trusts and foundations, to the other funders. So we use this to hold ourselves to account to make sure we are making the best possible use of those resources. Um, but we also use research and data to hold others to account, in particular governments, the UK government, devolved government, local authorities, being able to track changes, to use public data and also bespoke research to hold people to account for whether they are taking the actions that will reduce the need for food banks, reduce the level of deep poverty out there, or whether the things that they are doing is exacerbating this problem. Uh, and that is a really important role we play. Uh, with our network and people with lived experience to be that strong voice holding people to account for this. Just move on to the next slide. So finally, just thinking about some of the challenges that we find in relation to being able to use data and research to do all these different things. The first Deborah mentioned uh, having, com having uh, conflicting views about um, what is the right way, the most appropriate way to understand and measure poverty, hardship, destitution. And I think we've particularly seen in the last 10, 15 years, we saw a kind of breakdown in consensus around measures. And what I think many of us found is that made it incredibly hard to achieve policy progress, because every time you try to talk about what should be done, you end up in a debate about which measure you should be using. So I was part of the Social Metric Commission. I am part of the Social Metrics Commission. And our goal was to bring together experts and people from different parts of the political spectrum, pool our knowledge, our expertise, our ideas, draw from what else had been done before, and create a set of measures that could hopefully recreate that consensus and let us get back to talking about what we should do about this problem, not whether we're measuring it well. The other uh, problems, challenges that I think many of us face. Obviously, you get big data lags, the big household surveys. You are waiting many months to find out what's happening and then trying to think, how current is this once we get it? And some of those hidden but really important challenges of declining coverage and accuracy of a lot of our major surveys. So that COVID made that worse, but it's not just that. So response rates have got much lower from for most surveys. They're generally falling. The shift to conducting surveys primarily by phone or online is also, I think, really creating challenges for us. And um, there isn't sufficient, I think, discussion of what it means 
to have the kind of retreat from primarily face-to-face -face interviewing uh, that we've seen and the real difficulty of in getting to interview people who live in flats behind entry phones um, where you've got more people in private renting, where you've got mobility that's high and it's harder to get access. Um, we're also seeing attrition in some of those surveys and crucially there is population who are not in households who are not covered by those surveys and I think we as a community have failed to address those people's experiences. Got some of the other challenges there but I'm going to pause here we can come back to them later in the Q&A if people want to follow up. So thank you very much and I'll pass back to Deborah now. Uh, thanks so much Helen, such um, thought a thought provoking presentation in such a short time. Uh, I think showing the importance of measurement, but also just the importance of data um, and the messages that you are able uh, to get over. If you told me 10 years ago and 15 years ago that we'd be facing the levels of hunger that we're facing in the UK now, I I'm not sure I would have believed it. So um, such crucial work. So while with all with Helen's thoughts ringing in your ears, we're going to move on to Ed Davis. Um, Ed joined the Centre for Social Justice in 2016, but he's recently returned following a couple of years in government as an expert advisor to several health secretaries. Prior to his career in Westminster, he was a journalist with a specialism in health policy, including seven years as a senior editor at the British Medical Journal based in the UK and the US. So thanks, Ed. Over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Uh, and th thanks all for coming. It's great to be here. Um, I will talk you a bit through what the Centre for Social Justice is. It's a slightly unusual um, organisation, if you don't know us. Uh, I will talk a little bit about how we do our projects, and then I will give you an example uh, of one of our recent projects and the different ways we use data in that. Um, so firstly, about the CSJ. Um, we are sort of primarily a think tank. Uh, so we go next slide, please. I feel like Chris Whitty. Um, we, we sort of look at the root causes of poverty. Uh, and we talk particularly about our five pathways, uh, which are family breakdown, work and opportunity, educational failure, addiction and problem debt. They're the, the first five of those big purple blobs on the screen there. Uh, and we tend to find that if you, uh, you know, any one of us can experience any one of those five things at any time in our life. But when they stack up and you experience two, three, four or five at once, actually things start to go really wrong. Um, and so that is the main focus of our work. We we have sort of uh, leaders in each of those particular policy areas. So we'll have an education lead working very closely with DFE, uh, work and opportunity, working with DWP on welfare, et cetera. Uh, but then we also work in a lot of other areas as well. Sort of the nature of what we do here is it's people don't fit neatly into boxes. So we do a fair amount of work on the criminal justice system. You'll often find all five of our pathways coming together in the criminal justice system. Uh, modern slavery is it's sort of a slight quirk of our, our history. Um, that some people came to us and said, you need to investigate this. It's very serious. So that happened in 2012. And by 2015, we were involved in the Modern Slavery Act. So we continue to do a lot of work around that. Uh, and then housing and communities. We always say about housing, it's not one of our five pathways, but we never don't do work on housing. You just can't really get away from it uh, if you're working in these areas. And I think there's a very specific problem in the UK with housing at the moment that in some way, I think some of our pathways are, are sort of eternal problems we wrestle with. Housing feels like it has a specific fixable problem in the UK right now. So we'll continue to do work on that. Um, I mentioned we're a slightly weird organisation. We are we're sort of two organisations. So we're not just the CSJ. We are the CSJ Foundation, which is that group on the right. Um, our way of working, when I first joined the CSJ, we had an alliance of charities that, being honest, was little more than a spreadsheet of about 250, 300 charities. But we have been formalising that because there's such a rich source of information for us. Uh, and while I was in government, we formally created the CSJ Foundation. And what that does, it brings together six or seven hundred uh, of the best charities that we're in touch with in the UK. They are all sort of fairly small, grassroots, community based. We don't have strict criteria, but they tend to be less than a million turnover. Um, and we, we we learn from them, basically. But they, they now operate in their own function as well. So we have leads around the country. We have, I think, five regional leads now, uh, and they pinpoint the best uh, charities working in any area. They connect them with each other, with local businesses, with philanthropists. Uh, and that's been quite an unusual move for us as well. We realized that through the Center for Social Justice, we were working with lots of businesses and philanthropists. Um, and actually, they were coming to us and saying, do you know a good addiction charity in the Northwest? And we were able to say yes. So actually, we formalized that. And the CSJ gave out, I think, about four million pounds last year through various trusts and foundations to small sort of local charities around the UK. Uh, and then we learned from them. 
so uh, a lot of these organizations are doing really interesting novel things at a very local level. Uh, and sort of if I summarize the CSJ in three words, it would be multiply what works. So we try and learn from what they're doing on the ground uh, and then multiply that into, into government policy. So that's sort of a very quick overview of, of the things we do in terms of how that plays out. So very quickly on the next slide, how we work, uh, we will go out uh, on any given project and understand the front line. So we've got all these uh, small organizations around the country. Uh, our regional heads will put us in touch with people working in that area. So if it was criminal justice, for example, I know that we've got Tempus Novo up in Leeds who do uh, work with prisoners, getting them back into employment. I know that we have uh, children uh, heard and seen. It's about working with families of prisoners. So I can go to these charities around the country and say, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Uh, and do a bit of just general speaking to people to start with. Then we come back uh, to the centre. Uh, and this is where the data comes in and it's where we have a data analytics team we can say right we've heard this does it match with the data Could, can we corroborate this evidence is this really what's going on how serious is it uh, we have policy experts uh, we can convene working groups uh, partners all that sort of thing uh, and then uh, impact so we are very much about impact we want to see our, our recommendations become policy and we're very proud of the fact that we have a good record on that uh, because actually if we're not making a change i don't know what we're doing to give you a very practical example then of, of how that works on the ground, on the next slide, we've got um, an overview of our Social Justice Commission. And we published this, this paper, Two Nations, uh, just before um, Christmas. And the bullets are missing from this slide, but I can talk you through them anyway, but they are an overview of the bits of data that we used from, oh, there they are, <laughs> the bits of data we used from this and uh, where they came from. So essentially this was a complete overview of the country what's been going on. It took about a year. Uh, we interviewed 300 of our small charities, actually, as a sort of a basis for this. We did polling with about 6,000 people, including 3,000 on very low incomes. That's get a re really good overview. But then we used lots of other data sources as well. So a few of them are there. So calls to a domestic helpline rose 700%. Uh, that was from Refuge. That was So that was a charity who gave us that. Uh, severe school absences jumped 134%. And so that's actually gone up further since then. It's now 160,000 children. That's a DFE attendance survey. So we report on that and we track it quarterly. Uh, 1.2 more million people on working age benefits. That's fairly well known, sort of labour market surveys, uh, ONS type stuff. 86% uh, more people sought help for addictions. That actually came from a charity called Action on Addiction, uh, who were doing some surveys uh, during the pandemic and in, in the years after. Uh, and then prisoners locked up. The MOG, MOJ produced a lot of good criminal justice statistics. So we've got a good wealth of that and we have a good understanding that there are some very good charities in that area too, who provide us with sort of individual statistics from each of them. The sort of the two areas and the gaps though, that I would say that we really struggle with uh, in all our work and they are on addiction and family and they're sort of self-reinforcing a lot of the time, which is quite difficult. So. Of all the areas we work in, they are probably the most sensitive uh, and complex and come with all sorts of different difficult emotions and thoughts. Um, and it probably, I think, people are slightly scared to measure and collect data in these areas as a result, but it means we then don't have the firm ground to stand on to have good conversations about these things. And so it sort of self-reinforces. Um, just to give you an example on the family stuff, I mean, you can't do randomized control trials on families. Uh, if you try and force some to, to get married, some to separate, send a control group to the moon, the ethics guys get really upset. So we are entirely dependent on doing observations, regressions, things like that. Um, and to give you a live example, actually, we're doing some work on loneliness at the moment. And we were looking at understanding society yesterday and how you could, we did a regression on that to look at uh, how family structure affects loneliness. And the reality is you can get a very sort of headline view of it seems to matter, but you can't get any depth behind it because the size of surveys you would need to be able to do a regression to a really deep level are absolutely huge. Um, so it's one of our sort of big drives is to try and get the, the big, big data sets, not just surveys, but where government collects data to try and include families so we can at least understand better what is going on. Uh, and then on addiction as well, I think it's one of those areas where we collect huge amounts of data on who is doing what in terms of uh, substances. Um, I think particularly today, actually, there was stuff out on alcohol. Uh, I was reading something about cannabis use in Scotland being very high, but we don't really understand where substance use and behaviours sort of cross over with addic addiction. And so uh, data on that would be really helpful as well, because I think at the moment when we come to solutions, we sort of understand behaviour, we can, we can give big numbers, but we don't really understand what's going on with individuals. Um, and so that, that that's the other area we have them. So I will leave that there. 
Um, but yes, my, my plea is sort of on family and addiction data would be really helpful. Um, thanks very much, Ed. I, I mean, I, I think it's really interesting. I think anyone who works in these fields, the importance of measurement, the importance of what we measure, the importance of how we measure it, they're all very geeky, but actually um, they, that's what provides the robustness to um, to present data to the public and, and to policymakers. So thank you very much, Ed. Questions for Ed, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll pick them up later. And I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker and to thank everybody for, for speaking to time so ably. Um, just to um, uh, introduce our next speaker, Lalitha Tri. Hi, Lalitha. Lalitha has worked for the Resolution Foundation as an economist uh, since April 2021. Her work focuses on living standards, poverty, inequality and welfare. And before joining the Resolution Foundation, she worked for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, both of those foundations of course, dripping off our lips daily uh, in terms of the robust and very important data that they are putting into the public domain uh, at pace. So thank you for your work on that, Lanitha, and over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Debbie, for that introduction. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Thanks. So um, just a little introduction. If you don't know the Resolution Foundation, we're an independent think tank and our work is based around improving living standards for people on low to middle incomes. And similarly to, you know, other people who have spoken today, I guess our sort of main data source is, main data sources are ones like the Family Resources Survey, the Labour Force Survey, Wealth and Assets Survey and the Living Costs and Food Survey. So big thanks to the UK Data Service um, for helping us use those surveys as well. And um, one thing that is very key for us and very key for, I'm sure, lots of people on this call is that the data we use is representative of a good quality and timely as well, because that means that we can analyse living standards and poverty as well as well as we possibly can and influence policy in those areas too. Next slide, please. So we're all here because we think poverty is important, but here's just a couple of reasons why it's really important at this precise moment in time. Next slide, please. So this chart shows the proportional people living in absolute poverty after housing costs, and it also features um, relatively new data covering the year 2022 to 23, which is sort of the first main year of the cost of living crisis. And it's particularly shocking to see in this chart that um, absolute poverty has risen in this year um, for overall and for children and working age people as well. And it's particularly shocking to see absolute poverty rise because this is where we measure poverty against a fixed measure of poverty. And you'd normally expect that to, you normally expect absolute poverty to go down each year as our incomes grow overall. However, there's been little progress on absolute poverty in recent years, partly due to these crises such as the pandemic and cost of living crisis, but partly due to stagnating income growth as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, it's also really worth bearing in mind that although the main rate of inflation has come down and a lot of cost of living support is being wound down, pressures on household incomes are still very much present so this chart shows the difference in the price level for different categories and how much it's increased in September 2021, which is when you can think of prices when they first started to rise. So you can see that, for example, electricity and gas is still 74% higher in price than it was then, and food is 30% higher whereas wages are only 16% higher. So families are still facing a lot of pressure on their incomes. Next slide, please. So next I'm going to talk you through a couple of more the more interesting ways we use data to look at poverty. Next slide, please. 
So this chart shows um, the proportion of children living in relative poverty by the number of children in the family. And what we have on this chart here is the outturn data from households below average income, but also our forecasts that we sort of create using micro simulation modeling. So I won't go into too much detail on this, but essentially we use the family resources survey as our base. And then we also take into account things like tax and benefit policy as they are and as it's set to roll out and also economic forecasts from places such as the OBR or the Bank of England. And you sort of put all of those together. And when we do that, we can forecast what's going to happen to incomes, poverty rates and inequality rates as well, based on all the information we have at the moment. So this chart shows that larger families are a lot more likely to be in poverty at the moment than smaller families and it also shows that these rates are set to increase over the course of the decade. Next slide please. So it's worth thinking about um, some of the things about the main household surveys that aren't so ideal. Obviously there's a bit of a lag when it comes to this data so you end up waiting maybe a year or so after the end of a financial year to access the HBAI data on that year. And in times of crisis where economic crisis, where things are changing quite quickly. So for example, during the pandemic or the cost of living crisis, we found it really valuable to commission surveys that have quite a quick turnaround where we can ask some of the questions that you would normally find in these household surveys such as HBAI, but we just get those answers a bit quicker. So for example, this chart shows um, the proportion of people experiencing food insecurity by various characteristics. And um, we conducted this survey in October, and I think this chart was in a report that we published in December. So that's quite a quick turnaround and it means we have access to more timely data and that data isn't perfect. It's not, you know, subject to the same checks that your large household surveys may be, but it's still a really good indication for what families are experiencing at a specific given time. Next slide, please. Another reason why these commission surveys are really good is because we can also ask questions and try and get at issues that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get at in your major household surveys. So, for example, when it sort of came around to, you know, the second half of last year, the cost of living crisis had been going on for a while, we were aware that a lot of people may be in more debt as the crisis had gone on and pressures on their spending had increased. So this chart shows um, the proportion of people reporting that either their health has been negatively affected by the rising cost of living or that they're feeling constantly under strain. And this is by whether they're in consumer debt or not and across the income distribution. So. As you can see, lower income people who are in consumer debt are the most likely to report that their health has been negatively affected during this time. Okay, next slide, please. So here's just a couple of points on how we can make some of the data we use a bit better. Oh, next slide, please. So um, the DWP have been working on some improvements to the Family Resources Survey and they published a release on this maybe about a month ago now. So this chart shows some of the results of a couple of things that they've been looking into. So one of the problems with the survey at the moment is that when people answer the questions, they often end up under-reporting benefit income and this is more true of people on some benefits than others, 
So for example, state pension amounts are more likely to be underestimated. And that means that people receiving the state pension may actually have higher incomes than we realize. And then a second problem in the survey at the moment is with the weighting. So this means that some benefit recipients are underrepresented in the existing survey data. So for example, universal credit recipients are particularly affected. So it's kind of hard to work out at the moment where these two issues leave us in when, as in when they're resolved, how things will work out data-wise. But what we do know is that there's a couple of things wrong with the data and that data that we rely on is not completely accurate. So we'd really like um, these improvements to continue. It's really good to see what we've seen so far, but it would be really good to have these improvements made to the survey and if data revisions need to happen for those to happen too. Great, so I'll wrap up there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, um, Lalitha, and uh, uh, lots lots of things for us to, to draw together. I think the issue of data lag is one that has also come up in the Q&A and hopefully we'll discuss that a, a little bit in the panel session uh, after the short break. So um, thanks to all those speakers, we turn to our final speaker, again, a name that will be well known to anyone who um, is active in the poverty space, Peter Matajic. And Peter's the chief analyst at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, uh, definitely one of our most important charities. And before joining uh, JRF, Peter worked for almost 20 years in the civil service. He led on a number of issues at the Department of Work and Pensions, including poverty analysis, policies, developing measures for persistent poverty and child poverty. And previously, he'd worked on fuel energy, uh, fuel poverty and energy price analysis as well, things that have become uh, crucial in recent years. He's interested in all elements of poverty measurement and is passionate about making sure that analysis has impact. He oversees JRF's monitoring strategy and their research reports, and we're very grateful to him for agreeing to come and speak with you all today. Over to you, Peter. Thanks for that introduction. So I've got loads and loads of slides. I'm going to go quite quickly, and you will get the slides after the event. So um, don't worry about uh, if you don't catch everything. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about understanding data uh, to understand poverty, and I'm also going to focus on JRF's um, kind of data they reproduce. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, what about the JRF? What are we? Who are we? So we're an independent social change organisation working to speed up the transition to a more equitable and just future, free from poverty, where people and planet can flourish. And you'll see on the next slide that that's that's what we're about. And then we're going to talk a bit about the external data that we use. Um, so we use data from family financial services uh, surveys a lot. They're the backbone to our flagship UK poverty report. You can see the cover on the right. And this includes the Fund Resources Survey, Hassel's Life Income Survey, Wealth Massive Survey, and all those surveys you can mention. So we, um, and it's brilliant that all of those are now available on the UK Data Archive. When I started at DWP, those data sets weren't as readily available, and that's fundamental to all of the speakers that we can actually do our own analysis rather than relying on other people doing their analysis. So that's been really important development. Um, but also a really kind of new area of work is the importance of administrative and forecast data. So uh, Stat Explore, which it does take a bit of uh, time to get your head around, but you can look at different admin data splits for benefits. Also look at something called the, ad the abstract of benefit rate statistics, which has benefit rates all the way back to the start of the welfare state, uh, which is really underexplored in the history of benefits. Uh, and then also benefit expenditure and caseload tables, which are available um, after every fiscal event as well. Um, so, um, yeah, but we also, as I mentioned, fund primary infrastructure projects. So we do our own data collections to plug these gaps. I'm going to talk you through two of those uh, in this presentation, first on destitution and second on minimum income standards. Um, so moving on to, um, we also do lots of less regular analysis as well, including a cost of living tracker that's similar to the one that Lalitha was mentioning. Um, but yeah, there's lots of other work on our, on our website. So looking at destitution, um, basically this is the really kind of harsh edges of, 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 of going without the essentials. So you're destitute if you're lacking any of the two of those six things or have such a low income 
um, that you wouldn't be able to afford them without the help of charities. And what do we see in terms of trends for that? Well, basically, we've got 3.8 million people in destitution, a million of them children, uh, when we last did this survey in 2022. And what's the trend been like? Well, it's been climbing very rapidly over the period. So in terms of um, the number of children in poverty, it's nearly trebled. Um, number of um, number of, uh, of people in destitution up by 61%. Um, and yes, really worrying trends. And basically, some of the two groups are really worried about. One is about disability. So obviously, we've had lots and lots of talk in the in the media this week and, and by the Prime Minister as well about disability benefits. But what you can see here is basically people in destitution are much more likely to be affected by disability than, than the population as a whole. And we know that claiming disability benefits is a long and arduous pro process. Um, and basically, when people receive those benefits, which from reading what the, what the Prime Minister said well, make, uh, might become harder in the future, actually is a key factor of pulling people out of destitution. So that's sort of a really important issue. And the other important issue I wanted to flag was um, a link between destitution and ethnicity. Um, and um, we heard from, from Nissi, Nissa Finney um, yesterday in, in the other session, but basically we see quite a disproportionate risk of destitution for people from black households. Um, as you can see from, from this, about three times higher risk than their population um, share should imply. So again, we're really worried about that. And some of the, that is basically destitution by design through the no recourse for public funds and, and some other ethnicity policies. Um, so that's destitution. Um, in terms of minimum income standards, so this is sort of the other side of the coin, and it's basically a minimum income, uh, minimum standard of living that's more than just food, uh, clothing, etc. It's about having what you need in order to have the opportunities and choices necessary to participate in society. And basically, we we look at this by um, having a series of focus groups and a four-year cycle. Um, so we start by, um, well, this year we're operating, updating all of our baskets. So basically we have focus groups who talk about what's needed for a minimum income standard. Um, and um, yeah, so you can see on the next slide, um, the, the four year cycle and basically look out for in September um, for um, a really massive report um, on when we are actually rebasing all of our baskets. Um, and sort of looking at all household groups to see what has the effect of the cost of living been on our MIS reports. And MIS is also used very widely for um, for setting the, the national living wage, the national, yeah, the, the real living wage, sorry. Um, and you see on the next slide, the portfolio of our products, there's lots of um, MIS based uh, products that are available, um, which you can see there. Um, and what we see is basically that even working full time doesn't enable households to, to meet the minimum income standards. Um, so you'll see on the next slide the chart that shows this, that basically um, the benefit rates are massively below uh, the minimum income standard. And then the first person working gets you closer to the line, second person working gets you even closer to the line, but the, even the second person working full time doesn't get you quite to the line for this example family of a couple with two children. And if you look at some of those other reports, you'll see that for other groups, but basically, um, yeah, the, the even working full time sometimes can't get you through to the mid standard, particularly with kind of child care costs and things like that contributing. Um, so those are sort of some of our existing, what we call anchor studies, but we're also trying to take an infrastructure mindset. And I'm going to, this is probably things for you to read when you're looking at the slides afterwards, but we've got a series of projects that sort of try and take data to the next frontier. Um, so um, basically we're looking at data from different data sources, both established data sources and new sources. Also looking at kind of how to get the data out there for experimental data products and also thinking about how do we build in the lived experience of people making sure that this data actually talks to people and talks to people's real experience um, and you'll see on the uh, that we've got some guiding principles about about what's um what's what we should be doing on our infrastructure work so on the next slide you'll have those guiding principles but basically the whole idea is that um we're trying to sort of Think forward, think about what this data should be like, um, sort of um, making sure that things are kind of trusted, making sure it's usable and accessible to be open source and and, and widely available, and also um, make sure that we're not, uh, I think Helen mentioned at the start, extractive. So basically we're valuing people's time when they're taking their time to actually fill in these surveys, using our data sources or talking about their experiences. Um, you know, it's really important to have that. 
but then also to actually be experimental and try things out for the first time. Um, and we've got, I think, about 12 things on the next couple of slides, which are basically some of the big projects we're going to look at. And probably some of those will or won't work. Um, but basically, we've got a variety of different different ones in different different phases. Um, so I'll just highlight a couple, well, one from each of these slides. So the, the main one I want to slide to highlight on this is our grounded voices work, which is sort of voices from lived experience, where we've got a panel of people who will talk about what they what their experiences of poverty is like. Um, moving on to the second slide. So basically, this is trying to open up some of our new data. So obviously, um, Charities have a lot of data. Um, can we actually use that to get an idea of, of of sort of what's happening out there, and also benefits data as well? And you'll see we've got example projects for each of these. Um, and then yes, um, then we've also got a project on unlocking banking data on, on the next slide, where um, some of the researchers on the call basically, if you look at our infrastructure website, which uh, hopefully we'll be able to put a link in when we send around the slides, um, we've got some licenses for banking data that um, people are able to look at sort of financial data that's you know open for the first time through this work. So that's really important to us. So um, what are my what are my asks for improvements on the data? Um, so um, I've got five here. So the first is something that Helen mentioned. So to take forward the development of the below average resources measure. So this is a social metrics measure. So DWP have just closed a consultation asking what should they do about this? And we've obviously replied saying develop it and make sure that some of the data gaps that are needed for that measure continue. Um, but also uh, drawing on something Lalifa said, um, basically it's been a, like a couple of decades movement to try and get these linked data into poverty statistics and it's really close now I think and the new grossing regime to tackle undercounts of benefits so it's been really kind of critical that um, that we're missing out some of the kind of impacts of benefits in the in the existing data um, using administrative, administrative data more and um, so looking at can you do an income distribution just based on benefits data rather than relying on the survey data? As Helen mentioned, we've got really concerns about some of the quality there. Open up some more information about universal credit, including calculating take-up statistics, which are missing and really a kind of critical part of how well is UC doing. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, and when I talked about service data becoming more democratic, I think admin data is still a bit behind and it's so hard to get access to it. Um, and yeah, I think there's more action taken there. And finally, having more of a focus on deep poverty, including on destitution. Personally, I don't think it's right that the only way that um, we get insights on destitution is, is for JRF to, to fund that work, where it's such a critical kind of social policy um, area. Obviously, we're willing and, and able to do so, but I think the government should have more of a focus on this as well. So thank you, uh, and sorry for such a uh, awesome stop tour, but thanks if you enjoyed it. Uh, amazing, Peter. Thank you very much. And um, raising a lot of issues that we on the data service are, are, are thinking about as well. So just, just before we go into the um, videos and break, just to say thank you to all of our speakers uh, also for acknowledging the role that the UK data service plays in providing access to data and to remind everybody who's here on the call that the data uh, is available from the UK data service to anybody uh, who applies, um, please go and have a look at it if you're interested in using data, but also that we act as a data repository. If you have data that you want to archive um, and keep, uh, we have a reshare facility uh, which will accept your, your surveys and qualitative data um, for data archiving. If you're interested in the um, issues that were discussed, we have user conferences for the family finance surveys, for the labour force surveys, uh, for crime surveys, and, and so on. And we love to see you all at the user conferences where we bring the data producers and data users together and we have a learning hub on our data service website do do go and visit it even if you've never used data before uh, we will help to introduce you to using data well so, thanks everybody and welcome back and i wonder if the panel lalitha and ed if you're here if you could turn your cameras on for everybody um that would be great. <laughs> so before I've got to, I mean, there, there's some very interesting questions that have come in. Um, before I have a question to the whole panel, Lalitha, there's a question that everybody wants to know um, that's come in about your um, presentation, which is about this issue of underestimating state pension uh, and why you think that happens, particularly with this income source. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more maybe about the underestimation and then also about what it is that you think is going on. 
Thanks, Debbie, and thanks to people who have asked that question. Um, I think it's one of those things where it's quite hard to know exactly what's going on because this is something that happens when people are reporting it. But one of the things that could be going on is that people are asked sort of what their benefit income is and people might not register that the state pension counts as a benefit. So they might not report that income or they might end up reporting the wrong amount of income, things like that. Whereas maybe with some of the more working age benefits, people know that that is their benefit income and they might be more likely to know how much they're getting. Yeah, so maybe there needs to be some methodological work done to improve um, the answer to that question. But I think um, it's matching with administrative data that's going to make the real difference, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's really, you know, interesting to see the DWP's work on doing that. And hopefully that's something that we'll be able to see in the surveys soon. Mm. Thank you very much. So a question that has really come in for everybody, and it actually featured in almost all of your talks, I think, is how do you manage the trade off between the timeliness and the reliability, the reliability of data? Um, so the trustworthy data that gets deposited maybe a year after it's, um, you know, been collected and been through cleaning and verification and su such processes. Um, what are your key considerations? Now, if I could start first with you, we'll go Peter, Ed, Helen, Lalitha. That's great. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, there always will be a, a lag because basically we want clean and reliable data. But I think there is sort of just looking at the process and seeing how quickly can they be done. So there was a little bit of a kind of improvement from from back in the day where it used to be kind of July when the surveys became available. And I know the UK Data, data Archive also have got a quicker turnaround time. So HBI was out last week, uh, about a month after it came, it was out done, which is, I think, a record. And so that's really good. Um, but yeah, I think there is, there is just trying to get the process as quick as possible. And then there is trying to think about other data sources. So admin data is out a lot quicker. Um, and some of the stuff I was mentioning about trying to use a bit more income distribution statistics from there might be a, might be a possibility. And then I think there probably will be a role for kind of indicative, less, ro less robust, but still robust enough surveys that, that different organizations can do. Um, but yeah, I think the quality has to be there, but trying to sort of nail down those processes. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess in, in COVID, we've all got a bit used to the dashboard and and you know data at large scale being being available virtually instantly. Um, Ed, what what's your take on this question? Yeah, it depends who you ask in our organisation. Uh, if you ask the data analytics team, they go absolutely wild if you use anything that wasn't really well checked, established, uh, and clean and everything. If you ask the uh, comms team, they'll say, well, actually, Parliament is debating this tomorrow. We need something on it today. Um, and so we there's a sort of we aren't an academic institution. We're a policy and a lobbying group. And so we have a bit of pragmatism about it. So generally in our long-term projects, we will use the best data there is. We will get clean, good, solid data, but we also just have to be realistic sometimes that if you know the Secretary of State is going to say something tomorrow, we have to get use the best we've got. Um, and that's not always ideal, but it's sort of just reality, really. And and do you commission your own sort of polling data for that kind of thing? Would you go quickly to, you know, Murray or one of the big um Yeah, we can do uh, not... other other companies are available. Others exist, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, we, we do use all sorts and we found that different uh, different organisations are better for different things as well. So we have a sort of a list of probably about half a dozen different polling companies we might use if we want something quick. A lot of them run omnibuses that are quite helpful and they can turn something around in the space of days. Yeah. Um, and that sort of stuff as well for politics, there is a sort of, again, a reality that polling is quite helpful to, to it's what real people say. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, it is self, often self-reported. It's not perfect. But actually, politics is a bit about what people say. Helen? Yes, yeah, so I think for me, there's probably a couple of things. One is to be really clear about the purpose. So why do you want to know a bit of information? Who needs to know it? How is it going to be used? Um, and, and then I think there is, so, so for me, there has to be a baseline of quality. So there are certain things that um, it might not be gold standard, but if it falls below a certain level, it is just misleading. Um, so thing, you know, things like if even if you're commissioning a bespoke poll, making sure it's got a decent sample, it's weighted properly, the sample is big enough to say what you want to. So we we I have a quality assurance policy which all of our teams follow, and things like we do not quote 
findings with cell sizes of less than 50, just as a standard, even if it's a brilliant finding, even if we think it's probably right, we just don't do it. And trying to be, and you know, if the questions, we want to make sure questions are phrased in a way that gives you an honest answer, not the answer that we might hope for. And then just trying to be genuinely honest about what we know, what we don't know, what we think, what are the limitations? Because I think when you're working in the policy space and you're trying to create change, you need kind of fast, targeted information. But if you allow that to mean you compromise quality to, to below a certain level, you torpedo your own credibility. So I always have a thing, if we put out a stat and it goes big and it turns out we haven't done the due diligence, why would people listen to us next year or the year after? And for me, that, is, that would be us failing the people we're here to serve. We would fail our network, we would fail the communities because we would cease to be a trusted voice on their behalf, which is what we should be being. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, the, the, the kind of the, the link between data quality and credibility um, and, of course, at the core, core of everything we're trying to do in the data service to you know, provide access to reliable data, but, it, but it's a very complex space in policy. Lalitha, what, what Resolution Foundation, you use a lot of older, more robust data, if I can, uh, you know, more um, large scale survey government type data. What, what, how do you approach this issue? Um, I think I'll echo a couple of things other people have said, but also add some of my other own thoughts. So Again, it's really good to see the HBAI micro data out so quickly this year. You know, that's mm -hmm. that even just, for example, a couple of months makes a really big difference on what we can do and the work we can do. Um, I think it's worth sort of considering a range of sources and in a way almost use everything you can, everything like you've got your hands on. So... For example, our household surveys are really good, but may have a little lag. Um, our polling data is a bit more up to date, but there may be problems when it comes to things like sample size. So obviously it's ideal to have a larger sample size when you're commissioning those surveys, but there's the trade-off in that that's more expensive and you might be able to do less surveys. So bearing all those sorts of things in mind, we can also fill some of the gaps with our incomes forecasting so we can see what that looks like based on data we have and based on other places forecasts as well and you can also use data from other organizations as well to do a sense check on your work so say for example if one of your organizations put something out that was in an area i was working on and that my results looked different like I'd, I'd definitely question them and it's also really good to see places like the Trussell Trust and Citizens Advice where you've got people using your services publishing data as well because that adds some good context as well but it's also worth thinking about as well as timely data more historic data so for example we've done a lot of work over the last few years on a project looking um ahead to changes in the economy and an economic strategy we think the next government should have and for that we've made a lot of comparisons over the last 15 years so sort of what got us into the position we're in now and another thing that's useful as well is international comparisons so international data sources as well and you can sort of compare the UK to other countries to get a sense of if we're doing well or not. Thanks, guys. I think quite a comprehensive answer to that question um, and interesting to hear what everybody's doing. I'm going to move on to something completely different. A lot of people want to know this, but also we um, we we recently had the Evans survey. I don't know if anybody's yet on this panel has yet used Evans, the Evidence for Equality National Survey, um, which is uh, about trying to um, uh, show the lives of minoritized ethnic uh, um my, uh, people in minoritized eth ethnic groups um, and it's just been deposited at the data archive uh, for people who want to use it. The question that's come 
from the audience is could the speakers comment on their experiences collecting data from diverse ethnic communities and particularly how you've engaged with them you know have you found the process easy what are the what are the stumbling points and do you have any suggestions for the audience um and also if anyone's checked out evens just to say we have started to put training materials it's a complicated survey to use but it should provide um uh, i mean the weighting of it has been very complicated uh, but but we're hoping that it will provide statistical data on some of these issues. So that's the question, collecting data from diverse ethnic communities. Um, uh, Ed, we'll go to you first, uh, but I, I will go round the, round the room on this. Sure, yeah, we found it quite hard, to be honest. Um, I think there's probably two things I'd say about it. So to give an example, first, we tried to do looking at a um, sort of intersection of uh, race, family income um, and family structure on the effect they would have on education. And the reality is that even quite a big, uh, national survey when you do a regression on something like that you just even with huge samples you really can't get very far and so we, we do have trouble getting down to really granular levels of information on, on different ethnic minorities and the sort of the flip side of it and this isn't ideal in terms of data but in terms of just how we get information this is a lot of the reason why we work through different charities not just with ethnicities but really hard to access groups we work with these frontline organizations because they work with them day to day and so we can sort of work with each other. So this is an ethnicity example, but it's uh, an example of a very hard to reach group. We wanted to do some work with um, drug dealers. It's very hard to get hold of drug dealers. But if you work with an organization working with former drug dealers, they can help you speak to them. So we did a round table with uh, half a dozen former drug dealers. That was only possible because we had a good relationship with an organization that directly worked with that group uh, because we can't maintain all the relationships for the different, different people we want to speak to. So finding the people who can do it even if you can't, becomes a really important part of the, the, the equation. I expect we might hear something something similar. Lalitha, do you, what's your take on this? Yeah, so it's definitely um, something that is quite hard to get to when using your traditional household surveys and something you definitely have to be aware of when it comes to things like sample sizes. Um, commissioning surveys can help, and it's one of those things where when you're doing that, it's definitely worth making sure that it's going to be representative in terms of ethnicity so you're able to analyse it. But I guess one way that you can also um, get to more, more people of different ethnicities is maybe through qualitative work. So, for example, through things like focus groups, again, it's really important to make sure when you're Say, for example, a lot of the time when we're doing focus groups, we'll pay an organisation to recruit people for those focus groups. And it's definitely important to make sure we want to talk to these people specifically and set those parameters out. So then, say, for example, if you want um, to talk to more ethnic minorities or more low income people, make sure that that's clear and make sure you get those kinds of people. Otherwise, um, it can be like a bit harder. So it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to, you can't really be complacent when it comes to um, doing research on ethnic minorities because as standard, the data is not the best. Um, I haven't used even survey yet, but I'm definitely put it on my list to look at. Um, so I think it's, you just have to bear in mind that it's really important to make sure your, you know, data is ethnically diverse and your focus groups as well. Thanks. I'll go, I'll go to Helen and then Peter. Helen? Uh, yes, so I agree with all of that. I suppose a couple of things I'd add is um, it's important to think about how there might be unintended consequences of other research decisions. So particularly things like geography. If you know your sample is being collected across a particular set of geographies, uh, you have to think purposefully about will that have any impacts on who is likely to be included or not. Um, I think thinking about participation and co-production, so developing a study with people, um, not just jumping in and trying to do things to them, is very helpful, as well as, I think, ethical and very practical things. So stuff that we've been doing in successive waves of our research is getting feedback about how initial waves um, we haven't done enough around thinking about different providing resources in different languages, about looking at literacy, about those very practical things. The final thing is um, just being honest about resources. So uh, quite often for group 
for ethnic minority groups or for things like if you want to talk about different bits of the UK, you have to pay for booster samples and you need to be honest about whether you have the resources and it's a high enough priority to do that. And if not, be honest about the limitations. But by and large, reaching harder to reach groups costs money and we just need to either build that into the budget or accept that our findings have limitations. I think too often we don't really do either. Yeah, I totally agree with the, all of that. Um, Peter, you got anything to add? Uh, just a little bit. So yeah, A, that's just so critical because we are just doing some work on very deep poverty and ethnicity and it's some really, really shocking results. So yeah, it's really an important area. Um, and on our destitution study, we, we get to hard to reach groups through the services they use so that's one way of sort of trying to um trying to do that but yeah it is really important and the other one of our infrastructure projects is making sense of data gaps because i think there is a onus on the government to try and do more in this area understand society it's got to boost a sample of, of ethnic minority groups and that's really important um and yeah we think the government can do more as well yeah, thanks. And um, James has dropped in the chat to everybody that Professor Nissa Finney, who leads the EVEN study, um, was part of our session yesterday. So if anybody wants to have a have a, a, a look at that, um, do go ahead and have a look at that. I um, am going to ask you, I think, quite an interesting question that's come up about how you um, navigate the experience of communicating about data with the media. All, all, all of our panellists here do that extensively. And Ed, of course, you've also been on the other side of that um, as a journalist. And how do you balance newsworthiness against robustness, clarity, nuance, limitations, uh, and the general data literacy, both of journalists and politicians and public and, 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 and so on? Um, uh, and um, the questioner also wants to know, what? how do those internal conversations play out? Uh, and your tensions with media and comms colleagues. I, I feel very much this question has come from experience, um, possibly in an organisation. So um, we'll just go in reverse order. We'll go Peter, Helen, um, Lalitha and then Ed. Yeah, so I think it is critical being able to communicate effectively what the messages are, um, framing it in the right way. So we've done lots of work in the past about how you are able to kind of communicate data, but not to focus on the data in a, in a sense, to try and get the messages out there in a, in a better way. So I think sometimes it is moving a bit away from the, the data against it obviously based on the data but towards the kind of message because obviously all of the organizations we've got sort of things that we want to change and, and improve so it's trying to get that as the main thing rather than arguing over whether the numbers this that or the other so but make sure the number actually supports what you're saying and then there's the evidence there so i mean that's that's the most important thing and i mean there's always a kind of creative tension between an analyst and and, and the media team because the media team wants the message to be as strong as possible and we want it to be as robust as possible and hopefully almost always we meet somewhere that's where both sides are, are happy with so i think that's that's part of, part of the art of it art at ireland <laughs> oh, yeah. this art dark art <laughs> so i think there is i think it needs to start with a um a shared and explicit commitment to what you are what you are trying to achieve so whether you're coming from a comms or an analytical perspective what you want is to get a genuine, robust, honest, impactful message out, and you're doing it for, the, for a purpose. And I think you have to have a shared understanding that if you push the comms to a point where it's not an honest depiction of what you found, that will be bad for the organization's mission because people will eventually notice and they'll stop listening to you. Um, but also, if you insist on the comms being not being tailored to a lay generalist audience, you will also fail in your mission. So when it works well, you get a creative tension, you get mutual professional respect between the analysts saying, here's what you can say and can't say, and the comms people saying, here's how we need to express this. And then you kind of have to have an agreement. So I remember, Peter, I can't remember if this is when you and I were working together, a whole thing about... Um, when using the word household versus family versus benefit unit and trying to come to a shared agreement that here is some everyday language that we all feel is accurate, um, won't alienate the audience, but won't misrepresent. And then it's a judgment over what you correct and what you don't. So, you know, journalists always mix up earnings and income so that you do want to correct. 
there are other things if they mix it up it's not that big a deal but you know for us so i'm always have my with my back of my mind if full fact comes calling they need to find that what we put out was honest and accurate and we made a good faith attempt to make sure the reporting was honest and accurate because again if they find we haven't then it'll take years to rebuild our ability to speak for the people that we are serving I mean, that that quality assurance so, is so interesting and maybe we'll have time just to get everybody's single line comment on that. Lalitha, you, you, you're you next and then I'll, I'll finish with Ed, who's, as I say, seen both sides. Great, thanks. Um, that's a really interesting question because I think there's, you know, there's almost no point in us doing all this analysis and doing all this work if it's not being communicated and you know, if it's communicated in the best way possible, you're more likely to sort of make a splash and make policy change as well. Um, I think it's worth thinking about when we go on, say, for example, TV and radio. I think as someone who's maybe like an analyst first, communicator second, and I think for some of my other colleagues as well, when you spend a lot of your time in the numbers, in the data, you can almost over communicate statistics, if that makes sense. You you sort of talk in statistics, you're not necessarily explain, explaining what they mean, you're making it too dense. So it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, if someone's just sort of watching the TV or whatever, they're maybe only going to need two or three key stats and they're probably more interested in what do these statistics mean and what do they say. So I think when you're either if you're going on the TV and radio and communicating or if you're working on press notices, things like that, it's really important to sort of think about what you're saying and why you're saying it and what the narrative is. Um, and another thing coming back to that QA point, I guess the best way to make sure what you're saying is correct and robust is to make sure that your QA process is, you know, really, really good and really detailed and make sure that anything that goes out publicly is checked. So that's really important. So, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've had huge advances in data visualization and, and the development of infographics almost as a, as a sort of um, career itself, I, I think has, has helped us a huge amount to communicate um, statistics in, in the last n years say n as a data geek there I'm not sure of the number um ed what's your you'll have the final word on this what's your take I'm, on it i'm afraid i'm sort of like a former smoker on this i'm now incredibly cynical about the whole thing and uh, what have you so it might not be incredibly helpful um but uh, i suppose the first thing i always tell the team here is using the media is like riding a tiger like once you're on you don't know where you're going to go and you may actually fall off and get eaten so the first question to ask is like, why? Why do you want to use the media? Does it really help get the thing you want to get? So there are plenty of reports we do here actually that we don't release to the media very much, um, particularly if they're very complex or sensitive. There are some reports we just go and hand to a few ministers or a few important people who can look at it. So do think about why you're using the media. And then the other thing, just to be wary of, and this is where I uh, might seem overly cynical, but I think it is important, is understand that their priorities are not your priorities. So when I was a journalist, I was measured by how many people read my stories. Um, and actually, the, the truth is important. You know, they don't want to commit libel or anything like that. But ultimately, they need viewers uh, or they need readers. Uh, and so they need it to be interesting. And as much as you can help them, you know, in their, their sort of pursuit to have a job and feed their families and buy shoes and things like that, that if you can make a sort of a dual effort to be on the same team on that stuff, but always remembering that the context of... The media generally at the moment, which is incredibly cash strapped, is not what it was, you know, for the last 20 years, actually finances and media have been lower and lower and lower. Uh, and finding where you can be mutually helping each other to your slightly different goals is probably a really good way to go about it. Thanks. I, we, we've just got time, I think, for, for one more question. I know there are a number of questions uh, that we're not going to get the chance to answer. Um, uh, but I think uh, the the D James Lockwood and, and the data services team might try and do something compiling on that. Some of them were very specific to your talks, and I tried to focus on something more general. Um, if you could all just say a word or two, because I, I think it's another very important question about this difference between national and local data. So a lot of the data that we've been talking about, and a lot of the data that that you use in your reports, is, is the kind of 
you know, large scale national data. Um, and, and somebody has asked, how do you represent more local situations when relatively local data are often unavailable? And how should we address this problem? So I said, you know, keeping it short, but does anybody have uh, any answers for this? Well, Peter, do you want to have a go first? Yeah, of course. And um, so, yeah, I think that that's a difficulty, really. And that's a, if, you, if you want a nationally representative survey that's available at a local level, then it's, it gets prohibitively kind of expensive. But equally, that's where lots of the kind of actions to tackle poverty actually happen. So I think some of the administrative data sort of revolution has, has enabled us to do a bit like that. So we've got local level child poverty data, lots of kind of health and data and so forth and then it's the charity sector data where we've got sort of device data trust or trust data at that, that level which gives you kind of a, an angle so i think like lots of things it's trying to triangulate those kind of data sources without there's not going to be perfect data it's not going to be as kind of comp like as robust but i think by looking at different dimensions you can get a get a, get a, a feel for sort of the, the issues of a, of, a, of a local area i mean that applies for lots of different kind of groups as well but yeah really important but i think it's yeah you have to we have to really look at like what's what's available. I mean, Helen, I imagine Trussell, because of the nature of what you do, might have some very localized data. I don't know how how do you deal with that issue? Yeah, so we do um, operationally. We have local level. We have some local level data. Um, matching that though to local authority boundaries and other things. It, so things like doing looking comparatively at different areas or looking at trends within local areas, you just have to be very, very careful. Um, and I think Peter's right. There is when you're looking at local level stuff, often it's kind of you're, you're doing a jigsaw. You're thinking about what is the what exactly are we trying to do here? Are we looking at trends over time? Are we looking at comparators? Are we just understanding this area? And then stitching together your data sources. Actually, health data, there's been some of the um, cities have done a really, uh, are starting to do really interesting things, put pooling data into dashboards and so on at city region level, which is incredibly useful. Um, but I think also you then get into kind of gradations of caveats. So you stitch it together, you think about how robust your bits of your jigsaw jigsaw are, and then you kind of calibrate your message in terms of how strong you can be about different statements you can and can't make. Yeah, I mean, Ed, do you have any anything to add to that? And Lalith, um, I mean, sometimes it's sort of it's it's that matching of data and anecdote, which is always slightly dangerous. But so, for example, in our addiction work. We, we've got some headline addiction sort of statistics and new statistics. They're not great. But what I can tell you is that our guy on the ground in Stokes says they've got a real problem with a drug called monkey dust. Now, it's one of those sort of weird things that has just sprung up in Stoke. It's very Stoke specific. Um, but it sort of it feeds into a wider sort of conversation around different em emerging types of drugs, synthetic drugs that are coming on the market and how it is very local. And actually not using that as an example of what we are seeing in national statistics is, is quite helpful, but not to overplay it because we also know that we haven't heard about monkey dust anywhere but Stoke. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just had a, uh, um, uh, just dropped a cup of tea on my floor. Uh, <laughs> L Lalitha, I'm, I'm sorry to have interrupted you there, Ed. Um, Lalitha, do you have a, um, anything to add to this? And then we'll wrap up the day. Yeah, for sure. Um, Local level analysis is obviously really important and can definitely give us some really good insights, but is definitely a lot harder to do. Um, this is one of the places where admin data, for example, data on benefits that you can get via Stat Explore is really, really good because you can often get that at quite small mm. local levels and it's also quite up to date. Um, I think you can also, on a lot of the bigger surveys, you can get um, the, so for example, like the LFS, you can get it within the SRS at smaller local levels, which is something where it's yeah. obviously a lot more of a faff than sort of using the normal micro data we use. But if you know what you want to get specifically, it can often be useful for that as well. Um, I'll just give a, I'll, I'll stop you there, Lala, because we, we, we need to tie up, but uh, I'll just give a shout out for the Fingertips website, if, if anyone's ever ever used it, which is 
an attempt to gather social care and health data. And there's quite a lot of local level data um, that can be accessed through, through fingertips. I think it's been created as a sort of dashboard e-sync by NHS England. Um, so that brings us to a close for today. And um, I'd like to enormous thank you to um, Peter, Helen, Ed and Lalitha for really a very, very interesting conversation. I, I think poverty really does lie at the intersection of the need for robust data, understanding the data gaps and, and the limitations, but also the ability to communicate with policymakers. And of course, uh, something you're all involved in, which is advocacy for, for social change. Thank you to all our um, attendees for joining us this morning. We hope you found it a very interesting and thought provoking session. Just to say the recording will be available on the UK Data Service website. Um, and uh, we will take a look at those Q&A uh, and see if a, a blog or something might be forthcoming to, to answer some of them. Thanks for all your participation. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming and hope you have a very good day for the rest of the day.